Thank you, Alex. So when talking about reproducibility in science, I wanted to start with clarifying some of the notions important for reproducibility. And to start with, uh, I want to introduce a good scientific practice. So scientific research is committed to uh, the good scientific practice in generating new knowledge. And this also implicates some other notions like research integrity. Uh, Claire, um, you changed your screen. We are now seeing oh, the other. Okay. Hmm. Then? No, we're back. No, it's mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> no, then I have to. I think I have to share another screen. Oh, it doesn't matter. Ah, uh, I will just look at the other screen. Um, this so this implicates other notions like research integrity, which is important to to create trust and confidence in the methods and findings. Uh, also implicating the understandability, which is actually a, a quality of the comprehensible comp comprehensible thought. Then comprehensibility itself is the ability of stakeholders to understand well relevant aspects. And transparency well, uh, uh, it is uh, important to make the research process understandable to third parties. This uh, in, would integrate data documentation and availability for a good methodological word. So I've introduced the, the most important notions here. And then we can come directly to, to uh, the notion of reproducibility. So this, just in a simplify, simplified uh, uh, way of expression, uh, is using the same data, the same methods from a uh, description of uh, an experiment which should also result into the same output. And next to reproducibility, there's also the term replication or replicability, which would uh, integrate additional data or new data. Again, with the same methods, it should result to the same output. So, Reproducible research is fundamental for scientific integrity and reproducibility would be the minimum standard, particularly uh, if replicability is not feasible. So if you can't find with the available resources uh, additional data, for example. To have a visual overview on these terms and to extend them. Again, to start with reproducible, we have the same data and the same methods, which come to a certain result. Replicable would also result in the, in the, in the same output using different data and the same analysis methods. And then the bottom two variants would then be in, important for innovative application scenarios. So um, advancing from basic research to applied research maybe. And we're talking here about robust, using the same data and different methods to get to the same conclusion. And in the term generali generalizable, using even different data or additional data and different methods to come to the same conclusion. So this is about reproducibility, re replicability, and all the notions uh, um, introduced before. We can advance, advance to uh, the uh, cr criteria and the, the, the source why we are talking about it. And this is uh, our questionable research practices. So in the last 
decades, I would say, where several studies also surveying uh, research practices. And here we can say uh, one, one summary where at, at least uh, uh, a fifth would uh, agree to have committed questionnaire research practices and almost half would know of cases of even broad practices. So what are question research practices that could involve falsification, but also a fabrication of data. And other, other things are data trimming and data cooking. So explicitly uh, adding or negating results to uh, to to get to a wishful conclusion let's say and something which is often also uh, noted in in this regard is p hacking so working on a tri this involves also trimming and cooking of data to get to a certain probability that would uh, underline a hypothesis. Yeah, and these question research practices then led to an, the introduction of the term of a reproducibility or application crisis. This, this term was coined over more than a decade ago now, and it stems from the discipline of psychology, but also was taken up uh, in the field of medicine life sciences. A summary can be found in, in a paper from 2012 that actually uh, comes back to, to a paper from the late 90s, so last century, uh, from the psychology field, where the authors from the original study finally in 2011 confessed to a, to a scientific fraud on a massive scale. And after that, several replication studies have been uh, have been uh, yeah, published and filed, and showed other uh, issues throughout disciplines. Mm -hmm. And one summary, one more recent summary, showed that over half of the researchers failed to reproduce experiments, either from their own or from other scientists. And this can be, this is also nicely summar summarized by a recent paper. This can be due to several reasons, ranging from honest errors, so unintentional mistakes due to complicated analysis, but also to shameful cases of data manipulation. Now, I've introduced all the important notions and terms up to the replication crisis, and I can introduce our guest speaker. Oh, sorry, before I introduce our guest speaker, I just wanted to mention this site of a website of Retraction Watch, where you can uh, get up-to-date information of protected publications and what happens out there in the scientific world. So now the introduction of our guest speaker today. Uh, he will talk about reproducible research and how to implement it locally. He's a postdoc uh, at our university for a time being, and a former uh, student and research assistant at the University of Göttingen. I will stop sharing. And Nick, you can take over. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> Um, okay, I hope you can see my screen. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Claire, for the introduction. Um, thank you um, yeah, for being here um, and for listening to this talk. Uh, my name is Nick Scholand and I'm yeah, really glad to tell you a bit more about reproducible research and about how to implement it for example, locally here, and uh, give you an, yeah, 
expression about my personal experiences with that. Um, maybe to so that you actually know where, who I am. So basically my background is I'm from the field of computational magnetic resonance imaging. So these magnetic resonance imaging devices, as you can see it here on the right, um, you probably saw them before and probably also experienced them before. I'm mostly working on reconstruction software. So how to get from the raw data to the actual images and even in, get or extract more information from this raw data than it's typically used. That's called qualitative MI. Um, I mostly focus on, or I mostly work with an open source software, which is called the Berkeley Advanced Reconstruction Toolbox. It's a uh, yeah, software um, designed by a global community and who or on which basically most in our institute actually work. So, um, and I'm, yeah, I like open software a lot and I'm almost exclusively work on open software. Um, yeah, so in principle, I'm personally really lucky because I'm in an institute and I have a supervisor with Professor uh, Uecker who is really strong in reproducible science and has a really strong focus on reproducible science. Just to give you a rough overview. So for example, we have uh, biannual reproducibility event days. That's something I will talk to you a bit more later or I will yeah, elaborate on this a bit later. Um, we have a policy to publish all the figure scripts with our publications. So kind of our publications are fully reproducible. You can just run those scripts and uh, they will create you at least the reconstructions or even the full figures automatically. Some of the examples I worked on, um, you can later check out in the PDF here. Um, and we also even have a continuous integration framework to see if we have um, if we change our software, which is continuously developed, that this doesn't break previous papers. Uh, we work on tutorials, webinars, and workshops. So I'm really lucky to be in an institute which has such a, a large focus on reproducibility. So and from that, I want to tell you a bit more about how I experienced it. And um, my, my talk will be basically um, structured in, I want to motivate the local influence and especially the benefits you can um, get when you implement reproducibility in your daily workflow. Um, then I want to talk about briefly about how to learn about reproducibility and use that as a bridge to tell you a bit more about a tool which uh, I called the reproducibility day, which I uh, developed and we are actually um, working with since 2021 in our institute to yeah, have a lot of advantages. You will see that later. Um, so let's start with the local influence um, of reproducibility. So we've already, or Claire already gave us an overview about this importantness of um, of uh, reproducibility and I will maybe just add a few things to that. So it's really about this democratization and this democratized access to research. It's about enhancing this accountability of re this research integrity. Um, and also we have all this self-correction process which uh, research heavily relies on and this is also facilitated by uh, by um, reproducibility and also open science. So I, it's, I think there's a lot of, um, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of over, yeah, kind of joint areas of that. So reproducibility is one, but open science is also heavily added to this one. And um, yeah, there's also this opportunity that it can increase your productivity, but um, also the overall productivity, like for example, in this COVID research, what we've seen in the past years. Um, but as I mentioned, I want to mainly focus on the local perspective. So what do I understand under the, uh, behind this local perspective? If I think about our institute and um, about the way of when we implement reproducibility here, we, I see two basic areas where this can have an influence. It's on the on this whole area of our institutional or our institute, and on my personal um, on, on my personal benefits. 
So let's talk about the Institute first. So if you design a workflow or your workflow reproducible, this also means that you create a lot of documentation or even or at least improve your documentation, um, which make it much easier for colleagues to understand your work and to start collaborations. But also I will focus on the Institute itself first, but if you have a good documentation also obviously institutes outside of your institute you want to collaborate with uh, benefit from that um, this simplifies this knowledge distribution especially in the institute itself and with that can reduce the impact of personal fluctuations which is one of the largest problems i think or one of the many or one of the problems actually research has but personal fluctuations and uh, loss of knowledge is definitely one of that and if you have this knowledge spread and distributed that uh, at least reduces the impact a bit from going from the institutional side to the personal perspective so in principle if i have reproducible signs and i publish them openly this protects me from accusations of research misconduct so it really protects me um, there are also studies which claim that the paper citation rate is actually increased if you have reproducible work and you also publish this reproducible work so others can really work with it, go through your analysis, uh, run your scripts, run your tools and so on. Um, but overall, it's also just a really strong indicator of eager trustworthiness and definitely transparency which is also a very important point for research in my opinion um, this is more the general personal perspective so from my experience how do i benefit from it directly so reproducible research helps me to actually explain and share my work much more easily so if I want to go to a colleague and I have a project, this and this, I can just tell, say, okay, um, please have a look or can you give me a comment on that? I will send you a link to, for example, a Wikimedia page where kind of a documentation is on. We will also see the benefits about this later for um, this reproducibility day tool. Um, another large benefit is that if I have my own work reproducible, it's also much easier to to modify analysis steps um, from uh, or modify analysis steps I did before and use those then for future work. So it can really, for me personally, reproducibility really improves the effectiveness of how I work. And one other really important thing is that it gives me feedback about errors. So for example, I participated in a challenge with some researchers in Sheffield and they reproduced an abstract of mine and they could, for example, find that um, the figure in this abstract does not fully match the text I described because I had a perturbation level which was instead of 1%, 0.5%. That's not a huge difference, but it's nice to know and it's really nice no one else would have seen this difference because it's rather small, but no, no one else could have been able to find it if they were not able to reproduce this work. So it really gives me feedback about this work so I can uh, potentially correct it um, or yeah, at, at least have it in mind for the future and uh, fix those scripts. Maybe a bit more in-depth example um, based on one of my publications. So if I think about this reproducibility so what we typically do in our institute, and here you can see an overview of that, um, is we share not just the publication um, presented on preprint uh, servers, but also we share the whole software and publish that. We share the data, all the scripts, as I mentioned. And in this special case, that's not always the case, but also a tutorial to kind of experience how this works. And this is really, really really nice because um, this is quite easy to do if your whole workflow or your workflow is designed to be reproducible it's much easier to generate all the scripts and um, there are some key things 
I see which help you to design your, it also depends obviously on the discipline you are working in, but which can help you to um, create a reproducible workflow. And that's the first thing is focus on building tools. So the scripts or things you work on should help you to be or should be able to be applied to other um, analysis steps. So the reusability and the sharing is improved. Um, this aim of publishing the software automatically helps to regularly review the code and also to clean it up, to restructure it sometimes. This is also in our institute quite nice because uh, my supervisor also has a um, eye on that and gives us feedback about this. This is also a really uh, yeah, a nice position. Um, but at least if you publish it, there might be in the open source community someone who also can give you some feedback about that um, or even colleagues. Um, what I also recommend a lot is an automatization of figures that's kind of sometimes, or it's hard to start with, but it makes it so much easier to modify stuff uh, for revisions and really test reproducibility if this figure generation is automatized. Um, if you have questions about that, um, I'm really happy later in the Q&A to answer some questions about that. Um, and the last step I can really recommend is to structure your workflow in a way that, for example, in my case, with this computational focus, script publications are always in my mind. So they individual scripts are documented. If there are some hard-coded things, there are comments on that. Um, the keep it simple uh, rule applies to those scripts. So this really helps you also um, if you think back and you want to reproduce your work in a couple of months, um, understanding those scripts much faster. And yeah, debugging is also really, really easy or much easier. So that's basically from this side how I can benefit from reproducible uh, research and um, yeah, in principle, to some, I don't have to do a huge summary here, but there are many reasons um, to aim for reproducible research just from the local perspective. So it's there are many good reasons for the institute you are working in, uh, but there are also many, many, many good reasons for your you personally and your for, uh, for your work. Um, in the second part um, of this talk, I now want to briefly go over this idea about how you learn about reproducibility. So obviously you are here in this webinar, so that's a really good start. That's one of the best ways first to uh, get in contact with it if you didn't think about it before. Um, but in my opinion, or from my experience, most of the people le learn about reproducible in a quite reactive way. So from the personal side, for example, um, if someone, and I personally had this in the past, had difficulties to reproduce others or even my own work at some point, that was also the point when I then started to uh, think about and uh, reproducibility a bit more. And for the Institute, it's that the data or the documentation is actually lost if someone leaves the Institute. And one also really important fact is that the starting periods of new employees becomes much longer if this documentation is not nice, if the data is not there, if all the work is reproducible, this is much more shortened. Um, yeah, so what I would recommend is doing proactive learning. Um, that's nice. So as I mentioned, you are here, so you are starting with proactive learning about reproducibility already. So on a personal level, it's visiting events like it's this. We had the OSA Info Day um, a couple of weeks ago in the beginning of um, January. This is also a really nice event for this. Um, it's about reading examples or checking out examples or guidelines attending courses if the university um, offers them. We had uh, like good scientific practices and so on. Um, and yeah, also to learn it from supervisors as I had the luck with or co-authors and reviewers and so on. Um, discuss it with colleagues, that's also really important. Um, that's on the personal side. 
um, on the institutional side, there are even more things or, or additional things you can do. So obviously creating internal guidelines and policies is really helpful for that. So if a new employee is starting, they directly get confronted with um, reproducible research practices. But a second way, and that's kind of the bridge to the next section is um, we had really good experiences with organizing regular internal training days, event days, which is explicitly target uh, reproducibility. And this is the um, termed reproducibility day. So what is the reproducibility day? In simple, it's basically just meant to be a fun way to learn about reproducibility and to focus on reproducible workflows. It's nice that if they are reproducible papers, that's also great, it's easy to check, but it should give a comfortable environment to regularly experience reproducibility. The basic idea, um, or I had the basic idea to start uh, organizing this um, when I thought about live fire training drills. So what they do, they actually yeah, they kind of practice this um, fighting um, this fires quite regularly. And it's, it, is, it needs to be a reactive or kind of a way which works automatically because and you need to have experiences in that. And I think it's the same with reproducibility. So it's really important to get in touch regularly and um, also to test the reproducibility of workflows and publications and so on. And that is basically this origin when um, we started about the reproducibility day. So how is it structured? So the basic idea is really simple. You have a group, for example, our institute here, everyone in the group works on different topics. Maybe some have overlaps, um, but in principle, these groups are then clustered or this whole group is clustered in smaller individual groups of two to three people who ideally have different perspectives. So ideally some topics which are far off from each other. So they don't have prior knowledge about what each the other person, the team members actually doing. And then it's really easy. It's a full day, which uh, is structured in an introduction, but basically in two blocks. And these blocks are kind of the same. So in the beginning, everyone in this group tries to reproduce the work of the other group partner or of the uh, other group member. So um, they typically in our group, we exchange, we have one central documentation page and this central documentation page is then used as a starting point. So the other person in the group gets your, your for example, documentation page. And in the first part of this block starts to, to try to reproduce your work, what you actually did is going reading through your documentation, having a look if it's understandable what you're writing, if the aim of your project is understandable, if links and projects and so is working, if raw data is there, if the naming looks okay, if you can find everything. So there are many things which can be checked even up to if you have code which is running already, just run the whole reconstruction and will produce stuff, for example. And after this reproduction block, um, then it's kind of the groups meet again and exchange feedback. And this is really amazing because every participant can actually receive feedback about your work. So I think before that, uh, we, um, well, I think it's a really great opportunity for everyone to kind of receive direct feedback about their own workflow. Um, if you do that regularly, it would be amazing to have, or it is amazing to have someone who's going through your code and all this kind of stuff. And um, you can discuss your code with. Um, so it's a great opportunity to receive this feedback. And this simple structure is kind of repeated once in the morning and once in the afternoon. Um, afterwards, there's just a final closing um, session where we, for example, typically discuss feedback, how the whole day works, what were challenges which occurred so that we can um, solve it for future sessions and so on. Um, so that's basically a feedback round. And afterwards, social gathering is also really appreciated typically. Um, yeah, so this reproducibility just from the experience. So we did it now five times since 2021. The goal basically was biannually. It almost worked, but with these five times, we actually have 
or got quite some experience with that. And it was typically that we had 10 to 16 participants. Um, since Professor Uecker went to the um, uh, yeah, Technical University here in Graz, um, we have two locations where we coordinated um, this reproducibility day with. And um, yeah, currently we focus mainly on scientific personnel like postdocs and PhDs. But yeah, we also started to integrate interested students, master students, but that's always a bit difficult because of internal rules and access to data and code and we, we don't it's just nice to have someone have a work contract uh, for some of those things. So students is not even not always so, nice, so easy to integrate them. But in principle, it's definitely recommended because I, th in my opinion, you cannot start to learn about reproducibility early enough. So basically the advantages of this reproducibility day is that for the individual person, you can learn more about tools because you have a look and regularly a look into the workflows of your other group members. You can see what type of tools they typically use. How do they structure their workflow or what do they change compared to you into your own workflow and so on. It's a really nice thing to give feedback and to learn how to give feedback and so for practice and communication and also obviously to learn about other projects. That's one of these huge advantages of distributing knowledge, which I mentioned in the beginning in the Institute. This is the perfect way of doing it. If you have to or if you work through the work of a colleague for a whole day, you learn quite a lot about their projects and uh, from the institutional site it's very similar to reproducibility in general so knowledge distribution there's way more documentation which is created um, the networking and collaboration within the institute is really enhanced or yeah increased so um, because you work with the colleagues projects you learn much more about them and maybe you have a tool especially if the projects are maybe not as far away um, as it was originally intended, but then you might find an area where you can even work together and make something better. And overall, because this knowledge is distributed and, and the documentation is improved, this overall impact, impact reduction for these personal fluctuations. Yeah, so in general, um, this whole awareness and the benefits of reproducibility are really increased through this reproducibility day event. Um, I think one of the most important things of it is that it should be a comfortable atmosphere. So it's a really nice opportunity if you give someone the freedom. This is also the next site um, where I want to talk about how to get started with it. It's one of the most important things is to leave the participants some type of free or some freedom to design this day. So we have these individual blocks, that's a recommendation, but in the end, it's important that they have a nice day with this and learn about uh, things and want to participate in that. So it's really about giving them a guideline and this feedback and how they kind of do this reproduction and the feedback rounds. They should take some Thing for them and also um, that will help the Institute. Um, one really important thing to make this happen is to centralize documentation, code and data. That's really important, which makes it much, much easier because we had it in the beginning that it was not completely like that. So we had difficulties with assessing private GitHub accounts and so on. So having a central media wiki, for example, for documentation or a markdown based GitHub, GitLab or GitHub documentation page, then GitLab groups where kind of the code is central, centralized and uh, centralized storage solutions really makes this much, much easier. And I think is a great step towards reproducible science and everyone assessing this data. Um, this local guidelines i also mentioned before is really not a really nice have naming conventions and all of this so this is something um, the institute itself has to develop but which the reproducibility day can also really help um, develop over time and improve over time 
Yes, and the social gathering I already mentioned is also really nice for networking and team building in the group. So overall, and that's also um, the last summary of uh, my talk here, is that this reproducibility day, um, I can really, I would really like to encourage you to try this into in your research groups, to learn and to implement reproducibility locally, because you experienced reproducibility and learn about the benefits in your daily workflow. Um, you can learn a lot about different projects. Really, this knowledge is distributed in the Institute a lot. And one of these really important points is to receive feedback about your work. Maybe someone finds an error for you or an error in your work during one of these days. It's really nice that it's found internally instead of, uh, yeah, maybe then uh, having to correct it in publications or so. Um, also, yeah, the strengthen or the scientific connections are strengthened with